right, let's talk about developer joy. And you might think, why is this guy from Atlassian on stage talking about developer joy? Because, hey, we have the best jobs in the world, right? We, are, we create stuff, we enjoy what we're doing. So why in the hell is this person talking about joy, right? We're enjoying what we're doing. Let me take you a little bit on a time travel. Um, so something happened in the last 10 years of software development and things have changed. Right? So let's take a look at that. So for example, the cloud came up, right? And we had to learn new toolings, new stuff, how to deal with, with software that is running in the cloud. Um, then containerization. We're now thinking about observability. How do we observe all the containers? What, what are they doing? And, and how, do we, how do we track those, right? At the same time as microservices came, um, now we are just like not calling anything in the monolith. We have to just like make sure that the microservice is up and running on the other side. We have to create APIs and all those things. And then security and governance is also put on our shoulders now that things are running in the cloud. We need to take care of, of, of the whole like security and governance, right? And yeah, thank you very much, Werner Vogel from AWS. You build it, you run it. Now we are also responsible of running software. We have to maintain that. We have to just like be ready if the, if the service is down and, and, and fix things. We run our own software. So no matter what, right, all of these things came to software development in the last 10 years. And that increases, of course, the cognitive load of software developers. We have to do more things now. We're not just like writing the code. There's much more we have to take care of now. And now, actually, our bosses come, our managers come and say, hey, you need to get back to productivity. We need to be productive, right? Putting all on our shoulders and then saying we need to be more productive. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, right? Where does this obsession come from with productivity? So I want to take you on a short time travel. Are you fine with that? Traveling back in time? I guarantee you I'll bring you back uh, to 2023, but we're traveling back 125 years in time. One, two, three. Here we go, right? We are in the Bethlehem Steel Factory. And the Bethlehem Steel Factory, actually, they had some productivity issues. So at that time, there was no Boston Consulting Group to call or McKinsey to come in in a bunch of consultants and help us with productivity issues, but they hired one person. His name was Frederick Winslow Taylor. You might have heard of Frederick Winslow Taylor, famous for his Taylorism. So what Frederick Winslow Taylor actually did, he actually took out his stopwatch and just like observed what people were doing, right, and stopwatched everything. Then he was optimizing all the things, right? People close, to taking people closer to, to, to each other or whatever, right? But what he also noticed is when he, when he saw people shuffling coal, that coal actually was falling left and right from the shuffles. So what he did, he gave people, gave the workers better tools, so better shuffles, right? And increase the productivity by that. What he also noticed is that people could carry a lot throughout the day, or just like in the morning, but not as much in the evening. Obviously, people get exhausted, right? And they can't carry, carry that much. So what he actually did was he gave the workers more breaks in between. And all in all, people could carry more throughout the day. So, what this Frederick Winslow Taylor did was he increased the productivity of the factory workers by 400%. Boom, great, right? Totally cool, but everything comes with a flip side. There's some, some, some flip side to that. Um, also, he introduced actually new roles, right? It was different, the work was different for the factory workers. They were just doing repetitive tasks without doing any thinking. But he introduced the managers so the managers could do the thinking, right? And tell the workers what to do. Wow, um, this is not how we want to run software teams, right? And also that is 125 years ago. We are not working in factories. But how do we treat actually developer productivity going back now 125 years in time? We're now back in 2023. So how do we treat developer? How do we, how do we measure developer productivity? The first job that I did was my boss asked me to measure the lines of code, right? And maybe you have heard that, maybe not. But this is a real thing that software teams do. They measure the lines of code. I can totally game the metrics, adding more lines of code, but not being productive. Same thing with just like, OK, let's 
count the issues, right? But also there, right? I can, I can have small issues, big issues, doesn't tell anything about my productivity. Oh yeah, we have, but, but we have story points, right? We have story points, so we weight the, the, the issues. Okay, great, um, or you have t-shirt sizes, whatever, but this is just an estimate, right? We just like estimate in story points, it doesn't tell how productive I was. Um, but now we have actually something like cycle time or um, deployment frequency, and all of these things make maybe sense, maybe not. Uh, we can talk about that later. But let's say we have a, have a good measurement. But what, what managers do then say, OK, we need, to, we need to get the numbers better, right? We need to put more pressure on you. We need to have more deployment frequencies, which is a higher deployment frequency. I can still game that metrics and deploy more often, no problem. Thank you very much for everything, Vincent Taylor. This doesn't help us. This doesn't help us. And that's why everyone nowadays talks about Let's not improve the developer productivity, but let's improve the developer experience, right? We want to improve the developer experience. And don't get me wrong, I love the term developer experience. It's a great term, but already now consultants are coming in and say, okay, we can be certified developer experience. Actually, McKinsey came up with a stupid, stupid metric to measure the developer experience in a story point metric. Um, that's why we at last year we say, okay, let's, let's turn it down to the things that really make sense and that, that we really want to improve, which is developer joy. We want to improve developer joy. We want to get back, bring back the joy into software development. So what do we mean by that? Um, so developer joy is, for, uh, for me, if I'm working with great code. If the code is great, I can make changes, I understand everything in the code, it's fun to work with that code. If the progress, if I can do progress, if I have an idea on Thursday, can implement it on Friday and deploy it next week, right? If things are just like flowing through the pipelines, it's great. It's, I'm fast. I don't have to wait for anything. I can just like get shit done. Um, but also, the value that I create, if I get feedback from the customers, right? And they say, we love what you're doing. You're doing the right things. It's just amazing. Then I'm actually enjoying what, it, what I'm doing. At the same time, I'm also improving the productivity because I'm super productive when I improve these things. So this is why we call it developer joy. And I brought with to you uh, a few examples uh, from Atlassian teams, um, how they improve their developer joy, right? And the first thing is around quality. And quality is great. Uh, you can check that with a lot of tools. But there's also a human side to quality well, that we're doing. And we call it code reviews. We just saw that. So doing code reviews. I hope you're all doing code reviews, right? Right? You you're, you're, you're review every line of code, right? Okay, great. Um, good, good, good job. Um, so, but there is some resistance with code reviews. And it's, it's a little bit the human, the human thing in code reviews. So let's assume I have written that, that uh, stupid code here, uh, put it in, put it on a code review, and then put a pull request in, and then the first comment is, what the fuck, Sven? I said, oh my god. <laughs> okay. I'm a polite guy, so I say, what do you mean? Next comment is, this code looks ugly. Oh my god. I'm already done with that code review. I don't want to review anything. I want to do put, don't put my code in the code review anymore, right, if people react like this. But hey, I'm still a polite guy, so I ask, like, what do you mean? Yeah, it would have been nicer if you would have looped the for loop. Yeah, nicer, that doesn't help me either. Um, anyway, so if you are that person that writes that comment, here's an advice. Don't be a jerk, right? If you write code review comments, don't be a jerk. So who has been bullied by a jerk in the, in the last months here? No, don't raise your hands. I know your coworkers are in the room. It's fine, right? It's good, OK. Um, but actually, these reviews are actually the reason why people hate code reviews. Because they get feedback and they can't deal with it, or just like it's very direct and very, very uh, awful. So the Jira team actually had that problem. But they looked a little bit holistically on it and says, OK, if we look at it, the reviewer is in that protected bubble, and the author, actually, of the pull request is just like opening themselves up. So let's add some rules. If we just like add comments to a pull request, right? The first thing is assume competence. Everyone got hired for a reason, so assume competence. The second thing is be constructive in your feedback, right? The code looks ugly, it's not very constructive. And the third thing is just like explain your reasoning. Why would you have a 
rather a for loop than a while loop, just like, I want to learn too, right? So they wrote everything down so and then shared it with everyone. It's a review etiquette, and it makes code review more pleasant if people follow that rules, right? So less, less bullying, more developer joy. That's, that's basically it. Um, Another thing, um, once you have great code, what you do, you check it in, and your, your, your test kicks off, right? This is what the Confluence team does. And sometimes it happens that your test turns red. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bad, I mean, you found, a, found something that is not working anymore. So what you do is actually you look at the code that you just checked in and look at the code and just like try to find out what's the problem here. What's the problem that I just like introduced? Why is the code the, the, the test red? I don't know. So you, you use maybe half an hour to do that. And after half an hour, you come back and say, fuck it. I just like rerun the test. And then boom, test is green. Great. Everything is cool. No, no, no. You just discovered a flaky test. And this is really bad. Um, it's time for a commercial. I'll be back after the break. Is seeing red build after red build getting old? Is rerunning your failed jobs getting you down? Is waiting on those failed jobs to finish making you crazy? Deterministic Reliability is here to help. With our handy-dandy flaky test monitoring system, we will, eventually, automatically bypass those flaky tests. For four easy payments of free, you too can save time, ship quality code faster, be more productive, Feel so much better when you go to work every day. You will be happier. Your team will be happier. You'll stop dying inside. You'll stop banging your head against your desk. You'll stop replacing computers that are in a rage against the wall. <sighs> Sorry. It's just a little close to home. Call 1-800-ATLASSIAN today to get your free flake monitoring system. Please don't call Atlassian. We, we have not released the flaky test detector. It's just like a thing that the team built internally, and it works like this. So create a pull request, test kicks off, right? Um, and then discover the test fails. Flaky test detector said, hey, let me just like rerun it two, three times, and then test turns green. Boom, we have discovered a flaky test. Um, the flaky test detector is marked the test as skip because it's flaky, uh, and then also just like add a comment to the pull request to have a look at it, and also, yeah, send a message via Slack and the team chat to just like inform the team that there's a flaky test. All of this means just like less debug frustration. I don't have to just like spend half an hour to look at it, and more developer joy. Developers are obsessed with flow, right? Being in the flow, we all know that just like, and, and the code flows out of our fingers. That's a great feeling. But development is more like we have also the build and test phase and the deploy phase. And we can just like optimize the hell out of it to make it more flowable. Hours to minutes with, with tests or just like minutes to seconds for deployment. If we just like do small microservice, deploy just the microservice. But there's one step in the whole like development process that takes a lot of time. And that's the review phase, right? It can and take days until someone reviewed your pull request. And the Confluence team actually had that problem. They actually measured it, and uh, this specific team, the, the average that the pull request was open was three days, right? So it means just like three days of just like waiting, waiting, and then work on something else. And then after three days, coming back and just like remembering, oh, what did I do, and just like implement all the changes. Um, so they wanted to cut down that time. So what, what they did, actually, what their team lead did, his name is Punit Arura, Punit did the following. He just like pinged every reviewer that was sitting on an open pull request in the morning and said, hey, can you please look at it, um, look at the open pull request before you get into the flow stage, just in the morning, review that so your coworkers can go on. Okay, that's probably not a job for a uh, team lead, so they replaced Punit by a bot called the Punit bot. Um, so the Punit bot is now pinging everyone in the morning. Um, but actually, that way, they cut down their, their pull request time from three days to 1.2 days. Still room for optimization, still room for learnings, but actually, it means less wait time for the developers. The developers were not waiting, but uh, they had to switch uh, 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 everything, um, and more developer joy, right? Flow is so important that so things flow, right? We, we, we love flow. And sometimes we're waiting for other teams, right? And that's why I'm a big fan of autonomous teams, teams that can run end-to-end -end autonomously without an interaction with any other team that own everything in the software development process. Um, but 
that means also that you need a lot of people on the team, right? You need probably some designers, developers, QA people. Everyone needs to be on the team. So the Trello team had this challenge, actually, that um, their, their ratio from QA to developers is 1 to 30. So not every, every QA person, they, they can't have a QA person on the team all the time. So how do they deal with that? So they looked at it, and developers were responsible for the automated test and QA for the exploratory test, right? And then the exploratory tests are done at the end, so developers had to wait for the QA person to give green light so they can deploy the next Trello version out in the wild, right? So that was bothering the QA persons, but also bothering the developers. So they turned QA into quality assistance. Now the developers are responsible, actually, for also doing the exploratory test. And it goes like this. They do together a QA kickoff. So the developer and the QA person, the quality assistance person, sit together. And uh, the developer is learning how to better test things. Um, so they do this kickoff where they write down the test plan. And then the developer takes the task, develops the, 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 the software, does the test themselves because they have done the test plan together and then can deploy the software without a QA person involved. There's a demo involved and I come to that in a, in a bit to um, so just like have a, have a double check there. So the QA per people, they are now running test environments. So they are also helping developers to reduce their cognitive load. So all test data, creating test data, building test environments for developers to help them to test faster is done by the quality assistance persons. People. So it leans, means less developer cognitive load and at the end more developer joy. So the last example that I want to take is from the Jira team. The Jira team actually, they have a lot of product managers and the product managers are great. They care about all just like what, the, what, what we need to build next into Jira. So they do a lot of research, measurements, interviews, experiments, you say that. But then What's the normal thing is you squeeze everything into lo small little user stories and the developers take over and develop the thing. And then at the end, the product people say, oh, so that's not what we meant, actually. Sorry. So um, Jira team had this problem. So how do we bring better together the product people and the developers? So we developed a framework for that. We looked at it and said, OK, the developers are responsible for the make phase, what we call the make phase, creating the software. And the product people are responsible for the wonder phase. We added some more phases here, like the explore phase and, uh, and, and, and the uh, impact phase. Um, but if you look at it, developers are not owning all the things now. They just like being involved in the wonder phase and being involved in some other phases, where the product people are more involved in the wonder phase um, and, and driving that forward. So we created actually milestones in between so we say, okay, we're doing a project kickoff, so everyone knows what, what we want to build, right? The product people, the IT people, um, the QA people, everyone, the designers, everyone involved. So they get the reasoning why they build the things. And the explore phase, say, the developers are also saying, okay, great Figma designs, but we need to see if this technical feasible. So we just like build our own technical prototypes. So they get involved in that too. The product people, on the other hand, gets involved in the, in, the, in the whole development phase. We're doing regular demos to demo the software, to demo, uh, to, to, to just like involve the product people to give early feedback. And then in the impact phase, we're doing uh, uh, gold signals measures. So let me talk a little bit about the demos that we are running. So the demos are actually one important thing with the demo sessions is that everyone can join. Nowadays, they are normally running over Zoom and they are recorded, so I can watch them in my time zone when they're running in Australia. So, but everyone can join. Product people, QA people, marketing people, everyone joins, joins the demo session. And then it's outcome oriented. We don't talk about implementation details. We talk about customer value. Um, and we challenge the, the solutions. It's a group thinking exercise. So if the product people say, oh, I know we've wrote it down this way, but we want to take it back to the, to the customers to see if this is really working for them. So we can actually change things early in the process. It helps to change things early and not late and be frustrated that we need to do, introduce late changes. And then also it's a, it's a room for celebration because we all work on that feature together to give that to the customer. Customers, sorry, rubber duck, uh, to the customers. So just like um, to see um, um, and, and, and celebrate and come together and celebrate our successes. It means less rework frustration and um, at the end, more developer joy. But you say just like, okay, these are all fluffy things that you just like trying to optimize. What would actually Frederick Winslow Taylor say to that with his stopwatch? 
Yeah, so he didn't say that, but Peter Ducker said that. He said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So of course, we are also measuring our software development performance. And if you want to start with something, start with the DORA metrics, right? The DORA metrics are great, just like take a look at it, but Here's the thing, right? It's not for every team, right? Dora metrics are great for microservice teams. For mobile teams, deployment frequency, deploy deploying 10 times a day to the App Store doesn't make really sense, right? So look what your team needs. Where's the problem in your team and choose those metrics. Um, we're using our own tool called Compass for that. Um, and we have our, our de 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 developer health in there, our DevOps health in there. Um, and we're not just doing the measurements, we also have baselines. If we, if we cross a baseline, we have to do something. Um, we have to change change something. Things turn orange or red, right? The metric goes, goes, goes red. Um, but here's the thing. Um, sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's okay if a metric turns red. So there's a human side involved too, right? Developers know why a metric turned red. Uh, maybe you're working on something very complicated in the subsystem and you can't deploy that often. Cool, right? That's why we have this weekly ritual with, with developers where the team comes together and talk about what they just saw. And sometimes we need to change something. We're writing down the actions um, and sometimes we say, it's okay, it's fine, right? And we can't do that directly in, in, our, in our tool and in, in Compass to just like write everything down right besides the metrics. But this is just like showing us signals that something might be wrong, right? Some people, and I talked to a lot of companies, want to treat software development like a production line. We optimize everything out of that, right? We throw the idea in on, on this side and get the working software out on the other side. It's not working like that. Tell, let, let me tell you that. That's not software development. We're not building cars at the same car all over. We are building software. We create something new every day, right? And we can't just like optimize it like that. So software development is not a production line. Another quote here is just like, measure what is important. Don't mod make important what you can measure, right? So also, don't just look, look at the metrics because you developers, you know actually what's, 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 what sucks with software development. So also go in and ask your developers. That's why developer experience surveys are so important. We call them, of course, developer joy surveys. And uh, we give them, we ask people actually, how satisfied are you with your speed to ship quality code? How satisfied are you with your waiting time? How satisfied are you with your execution independence, autonomous teams? How satisfied are you with your access to tools processes and practices, with effort managing external standards like security and, security and governance? How, how satisfied are you with managing your, your code pipeline and infrastructure with a ramp up time of new developers? And how is your developer satisfaction overall? Because this is a metric that we want to improve at Alassian. So we, we ask how satisfied developers are with these things. At the same time, not every team is the same. Teams are different, and some, some things are important for one team, is not important for another team. So we are also asking, how important is that area for you as a team? And then we're putting it on an XY matrix and have, have this wonderful opportunity score that we calculate, and we can just like see uh, where things in the, in the white corridor are fine, but if things move down in the, in the, in the, uh, under, under the white corridor, we have to do something. We give that to the teams to say, okay, you need to improve something. If you want to run that, that developer survey, um, I've put it on, on type form. I'm not collecting any email addresses or whatever. Um, you can just try it out and see how good is your developer joy and where are areas that you, that you should improve. Just scan the QR code. And then the next step is to just go in and try to fix things. I gave you some examples of software developers trying to fix things, and they just uh, go in, build a Punit bot, flaky test detector, whatever works for them, right? We give them the time. Actually, at Atlassian, people have 10 to 20% of their time to work on developer productivity issues. And we're measuring that, too. Um, and then it's also important, if you found something, to spread the learnings because every team is working on their own and just like fixing their own developer experience is not good. We are a big company and we want to just like spread the learning. So for example, the Punit bot, right? The, po the people from the Punit bot, they wrote a blog post about it, posted to every, every Atlassian, wrote about it, what they did, how they did it, uh, how you can use it. And now actually there are 20 teams within Atlassian, not every team, but 20 developer teams in Atlassian that run the Punit bot that are pinged every morning and said, hey, you have an open pull request. So 
Here's the sum up. Take your measurements, right? Metrics are not bad, but just like they are just like showing signals. Take those and the survey results. And the important thing is that you need to give that to the teams, not a developer productivity team. It's the team itself that you need to give those metrics to. These autonomous teams that are able to fix things. Give them time also in their, in their work to fix things. So they can actually improve the, 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 the developer quality the developer progress and the value that they create for the customers. And I said that at the beginning, if I work on great quality code, if things flow fast through the pipeline, less waiting time, and my customer give me feedback that everything is, is, is great, I'm building the right stuff for them. Right in the middle there, and I always sort of do a Venn diagram in my talks, um, so here it is. This is actually where developer joy is happening. So here's the thing. Don't forget to have fun, right? Don't forget to have fun. We became developers for a reason, because it is fun to create stuff and to see people really using, using our things. So don't forget to have that uh, and improve your developer joy. Thank you very much.